Well, I can honestly say that I'm as enthused about this as any study we've ever done, not just because of how the Lord's already used it in my life, but because of how I believe he's going to use it in your life. And uh, Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks uh, in his heart, so is he. And uh, the idea there is, is that thinking uh, determines outcome more than anything else. Now, for 25 years, I've been drilling down on this matter of behavior. In the late 90s, I taught a series called How to Change Four Parts that became, uh, in the year 2000, uh, a series called I Really Want to Change, So Help Me God. It was my first book. It's a DVD series. God's used it in powerful ways <clears throat> in a lot of places, and it became... Uh, uh, later on, uh, Lord, change me. Now, that was a focus on behavior, Romans 6 and 7. When I get to a fork in the road, why do I always say yes to temptation? Why can't I say yes to God? And how do I say no to temptation and yes to God? That was the Lord, change me series. But as I kept thinking about it and praying about it and asking the Lord to change me and asking the Lord to change us, I had to get to a deeper level on the subject. And so... Uh, right around 2002, we took an old series from the 90s that was called The Five Scars on a Hardened Heart, and we put the New Testament attitudes that replace it in place, put off the old, put on the new, and uh, that series was called Lord Change My Attitude, the idea that attitudes are patterns of thinking formed over a long period of time, and we worked on some negative attitudes like criticizing, complaining, doubting, rebelling, and the New Testament attitudes that take their place like acceptance and submission and gratefulness and love, but still we're at a pretty behavioral level. And, and, and criticism is behavior, and, and uh, so uh, I've been wrestling, you know, what really uh, at a deeper level is the thing that has to change if behavior is going to change, and that's what gets us to this now kind of third message in this, honestly, trilogy that I've been giving my life to. This is, you are at harvest at the right time. And just as those series changed our lives and changed our churches, uh, this series, I would like to just say uh, prophetically uh, and prayerfully over us, uh, this series is going to change us. Uh, many of us are going to mark uh, a deeper relationship with the Lord, a greater experience of victory, a more consistent joy to the fall of 2014 and, and a time when God showed us from his word that real change means uh, thinking differently. And if you have faith now uh, to embrace that uh, possibility and potential, just uh, lift up your voice and say amen. 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 Now in that, again, uh, the key is the thinking. Uh, Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So uh, why does Bill lose his temper and yell at his wife? And why does she respond by having the second and third uh, glass of wine every night uh, to dull her pain? And uh, why is their daughter uh, so deeply involved in sinful and shameful behavior that really never delivers uh, the uh, relief that she uh, is looking for? The reason is... If you want to get to the heart of it, it's the way they think. Why does Kevin blow up every relationship that gets close to him? Because he believes that proximity equals pain. Yeah, that's what he thinks. And so when he gets close to a person, eventually he'll find a way to get cross with them and blow it up because he doesn't want people to get close because that's only going to hurt him. That's, now listen, is, is he right about that? No, he's wrong about it. But you've got to hear this. It is the way he thinks. And this is super important right now. I'm on it. Nothing will be different until I think differently. Okay? Nothing will be different until we think differently. Why is Kim so secretive and so hyper-private? Why is she so afraid to make herself known? Because she's been rejected. She doesn't want to experience it again. Is she right? No, she's wrong the way she's acting. But her acting is flowing from her thinking. And nothing will be different until she thinks differently. Let's talk about our boss for a minute. Yeah, man, yeah, man. so glad you brought him up. I'm super comfortable when you're talking about someone else and not me. Okay, that's also because of how we think, but we'll talk about your boss for a second. Why is my boss so controlling? Why is he micromanaging me, looking over my shoulder all the time? Why is he like that? Because he believes that the only way to ensure, she believes that the only way to ensure performance 
is to get right in there and make it that she doesn't understand about motivating people and, and just a better way to lead. And it doesn't matter how many speeches you give or how many times you appeal to her boss until she thinks differently about that. That's just not going to ever really be different. And uh, you know, when's my dad going to stop with all the stoic stupidity and, and start telling me he loves me? I, I think he feels it, but why can't he say it? Well, there's some things going on in the way that he thinks about being that vulnerable. He said, it's not that vulnerable. People say it all the time, but he thinks that it is. And, and you may be able to press them on Christmas Eve and get the words out, but they're not going to flow freely the way that you want them to until he actually starts to think differently about that. And, and why can't Sheila let down and have some fun, man? She's so serious all the time. And, and when's Steve going to have enough money in that savings account of his to actually spend some of it and start living? Um, Maybe not ever. He won't ever see it as enough until he thinks differently about life and about stewardship. Linda is hypercritical. Lance is lazy and lethargic. Changes jobs like most people change their socks. Lisa is an overeater. Lyle is an overachiever. And Larry is complaining every minute his eyes are open. And Lou is losing again to sexual temptation. And Lauren is leaving her loved ones in the lurch again. Why? Are those things right? No, they're not right. But simply telling them this is wrong, this is right, isn't going to fix it. Take it from someone who spends their entire life saying to people, not this, this, not this, this. You can ask Dr. Phil. You can say it and say it and say it, and people will still do in line with their thinking. You can scream, Jerry, 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 Till the cows come home, no one's changing, really changing, until they change right here. I'll say it again, Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. All right, we're going to pray at the end, so listen. So if the thinking change is the real change, the lasting change, the big change, all in favor of change? All right, come on now, we're voting. You have to leave if you're not with me. All in favor of change? All right. But we have to change the way we think. Now, so I want to spend the entirety of our time uh, today on, well, if thinking is the lasting change, why aren't more people changing? Here's why. Because it is terrifically difficult to change the way you think. And to show that to you, I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're just going to go over kind of four main uh, concepts in the time that we have. But first, I've got to give you the context here, so let's uh, jump in. Uh, by the way, let me just say that the Corinthians are the worst Christians in the New Testament, okay? They're the worst, the worst. And, and, uh, but I don't I want to think uh, wrongly about them or about us. I doubt if there was much that they're struggling with that we're not struggling with. They were, it was a, a very, very a sexually indulgent church, very sinful. They had tons of conflict in the church. Um, they, uh, were, they had false teaching uh, in the church that was really causing problems. Uh, these, this, Christ, this church here, they used to say about Paul, they would say when he would write them a letter, like, ooh, ooh, your letters, they're so big, but then when you come here, you're not so big, are you? That's what they used to, you don't believe that? Look at 2 Corinthians 10, 10. Paul said, for they say, he's talking to them, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. They're like, you might say that in a letter, bro, but you won't say that to our face. So here's Paul's answer to it. 2 Corinthians 10, 1. I, look at the gracious godliness here. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I'm begging you. I who am humbled, oh, this is what you say about me? I'm humble when face to face with you, but bold, bold toward you when I'm away? I know what you've been saying. Verse 2, I beg of you that when I'm present, I may not have to show boldness. You don't think I can get up in your face? You don't think I can lay it down? Paul says, I'm begging you, don't make me do that. I can do it. I can do it. But why are you making me? I don't want to do that. I beg of you that when I'm present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I show 
as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. Now, starting in verse 3, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, four verses comes four reasons why it's so hard to change your mind. In fact, we could go on and talk about Corinthians. Maybe someday we'll study that whole book. But for right now, we're lifting that part out because it's the most concentrated teaching on our thinking. You with me? It's the most concentrated teaching on our thinking in the whole New Testament. So we're in the right place here. And uh, start here. Why is it so hard to change my thinking? Because my battles are not primarily physical. Where are you getting that, Pastor James, from verse 3? See it there? For though we walk in the flesh, word walk is used 32 times by the Apostle Paul. Uh, he says in Galatians, walk in the spirit. In Ephesians, he says, walk worthy. It's the idea of live your life, that your, your Christian life is like a walk. All these steps, just one step at a time, this is your Christian life. And so when he says we walk, he means we live our life, verse 3. We walk in the flesh. The, the word there, sarks. Sometimes in the Bible, it means your old nature, your sinful nature. But in this instance, it just means your body. It just means your body, your physical reality. Look up here. Do you understand that you're not just physical? There's a part of you that will live somewhere forever with God or separated from him based on you, what you do with his son, Jesus Christ. Okay? And the most important part of you is not the physical part of you. The most important part of you is the mind, emotions, will, which makes up your soul. And if you're saved, it became a living spirit. Okay? Um, that part of you is the part of you that will live forever. That's where your mind is. And your mind, not your brain, we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Not your brain, but your mind. That's what he's working on here. So when he says, we walk in the flesh, though we walk in the flesh... What he means is, is uh, we live our lives on this physical reality. We are material people living in a material world. Seems like somebody said that at some point. Um, does he know? Does he know? He knows. And so we're material people in a material world, in a physical reality, and everything around us seems so physical. Paul says, but don't get mixed up, okay? Okay. Um, we are not primarily fighting a physical battle, okay? Now, um, the reason the word primarily is there is because I want to just acknowledge for a second uh, that there are, okay, so um, let's just talk about the top 1,000 problems in our world. Skip that. Uh, the top 1,000 problems in, Amer in Illinois. Is there 1,000 problems in Illinois? We only have one governor in prison right now, so things are going pretty good, but I... <laughs> Of course there's a thousand problems. Is there a thousand problems in Chicagoland? Yeah. Okay, let's, let, let me, is there a thousand problems on your street? Yeah. So you're getting a little close to me, bro. <laughs> is there a thousand problems on your block? Yeah. All right, we'll stop there. Now, of those thousand problems on your block, how many of those problems are medical problems? Okay. I think not that many. I think of a thousand problems, all the relational, just the different categories. There's some of them are medical, but there's financial. There, there's tons and tons and tons of problems that are not medical problems. However, one of the mistakes that Christians make when they start talking about our thinking is Christians are famous for not acknowledging the reality of mental illness. There is mental illness. Do you understand that? Two of my friends, two of my pastor friends' sons, uh, have committed suicide in the last 24 months. Okay? There's mental illness. And if you have mental illness, you need to go to a doctor. You need to go to a doctor. And so I, amen? That's not what I'm talking about, though. And, and I don't want to negate that in any way. I'm not negating it or de-emphasizing. That's why I said, did you hear? Primarily. Because my battles are not primarily physical. And once you take away the 50 problems on my block... Out of a thousand that are medical, go to a doctor. Now the next 950 problems all have to do with the people that live there and how they think. And that's what this series uh, is about. So back to the text when he says, for though we walk in the flesh, uh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. I mean, wouldn't it be great if you could just solve all your problems physically? 
So let's just say, men, let's just say that this week uh, your boss goes off at you at work and just fires you. Get out for no reason at all. Now, I'm thinking most of the men here would know how to handle that physically. I'll get right into his office. He's kind of, I'll bring my friends and go right into his office. And right? How many, how many men, lift up your hand, men, if you'd know how to handle that? All right? But what he's saying is you'd be making a big error because that problem isn't a physical problem. And when you try to uh, uh, apply a physical problem to a, think, uh, a physical solution to a thinking problem, do you see? So a different example, we got a lot of moms here. We got moms who remember this stage. We got uh, women here are looking forward to being moms someday. And then we got the ones that are right in the middle of it. And most moms raising kids have this thought sometimes. I'm not taking this no more from them. I'm, I don't have to hear this. My kids are not going to disrespect me. And then they think about getting up on that problem. I'm going to take it now strong. I'm not, and, and I'm not even saying that some good parental leadership isn't needed. I'm just saying that the Bible says that the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And you can get your kids to conform and still not get them to respect. And that's what he's saying when he says, let me read it again. 2 Corinthians 10, 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. The real battles, the real battles are not physical battles. They're mental thinking wars. We're all in a battle. The whole imagery here is battle imagery. And jot these down uh, quickly, five uh, mental wars. This is where the real battle is. Uh, first of all, uh, behavioral. Uh, behave, behavior flows from thinking. Behavior feels physical and it looks physical, but it's all coming from right here. It's coming from the way I think. I'll use myself as a negative example because there's so much to choose from. And I've never told you this before, but when I was in sixth grade, sixth grade, 1971, September of 1971, I was 10 years old. I was going to turn 11 uh, pretty soon. And uh, it's, it's a miracle that my sixth grade teacher didn't murder me. In September of, two, uh, uh, of 1971, I got kicked out of the classroom, into the hallway, down to the principal's office. In the first month of school, I averaged between two and three times a day. Get out. Get out in the hallway. Get, get out. I'm just telling you, it's, just, it's like on and on and on and on and out. Worse, my dad was an elementary school vice principal. My mom was a, a Bible teacher of children. So I got these parents that are like teachers to the max. How do you think it felt to my dad to have to come over to the school he, and, and talk to another principal, a peer of his? It, what's up with your kid, man? He's just down here like every day, four times. How, was that a great day for my dad? I know it was not, and, and, but I, I just kept doing it and doing it. Finally, they said, we got to help this kid. And so they took me out of there. I think they were getting ready to send me to some vocational school so I could, like, make bracelets for the rest of my life or something. <laughs> I'm telling you, and they started giving me these tests. So they put me in a room with this lady who keeps showing me these, like, black things on a, on a card. She's holding them up in front of me. What does that look like? A puddle. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Look at this one. A puddle. Went on for like an hour. I said, You got a lot of puddle pictures, lady. <laughs> then they gave me all these tests and stuff like this. And actually, what they found out was, was that it wasn't that I wasn't able to learn, it's that I would they what they said was they said that I was that I was bored. And and but that isn't what changed me because after that month I never got sent to the principal's office ever again, and I never got asked to sit out in the hallway ever again, even though it was happening several times a day before September of 1971. Here's what changed. My dad sat down with me and explained to me how my behavior was impacting the path that I was on, how it was impacting him, and the worst was how it was impacting my mom. She was really hurt and disappointed, and I saw it. And I changed my thinking. I, I didn't think. I thought it was cool. The kids thought I was cool. I, I thought being in the hallway is way more fun than being in this room. 
but I, my thinking changed, and I never thought about it the same way again. Now, that's how people change. And one of the categories where my thinking changes everything is in this behavioral battle. And some of you are battling various behaviors in yourself and in others, and you're making speeches and pounding the table and doing all kinds, but nothing's going to change until the thinking changes. Not for you, not for those you love. Here's a second category. Five mental wars, a relational. Relational. See, some of you think that you can't admit when you're wrong. I hear it every month in our church about someone who can't say uh, they're sorry. Um, some of you think, um, we're going to work on this, but some of you think you have to be perfect. And some of you think you're doing well at it. We're going to attack both of those. Um, maybe you can't see, like I just acknowledged, maybe you can't see that your behavior uh, is hurting others. Um, maybe you uh, think you have to be in control. Maybe you can't find lasting friendship and you blame it on the church you're going to lately or on the place you have to work and you've got a thousand reasons why you're so often feeling alone. But, but I love you and so I would submit for your consideration maybe a different way of thinking about that, that maybe there are some things in the way that you relate because of the way that you think that are actually working against you um, experiencing what you deep in your heart really do long to experience. That's a huge category of mental wars, behavior, relational. Completely different category, financial. Financial. And uh, some of you think, sadly, still, unbelievably, some of you still think that things will increase your happiness. I feel like the Apostle Paul. I, know how to be, I know how to have a lot, I know how to have a little. Paul said, everywhere in all things I am instructed, both to suffer want and to have plenty, um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That happiness is in no way tethered to what you have or don't have. So if that's the truth, why is it that there's such a big unpaid balance on your credit card? Why did you buy that? Because my thinking was wrong. I thought that that would give me. Well, how many times are we going to have to do that till we know? And, and that's one category. Then a whole other category uh, in the financial thing is the category of people who think that, 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 you know, doomsday and it's all coming to an end and make the pile bigger. We'll survive the longest. You know, get the dry stuff down in the basement. And, 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 and. It'll soon be two years ago since I spent about 10 weeks pouring my heart out to you about what the Bible actually teaches about money so that we could get all the crazy Christian nonsense out of our head. Poverty is not spiritual. Prosperity is not promised. But we laid all that out, and some of you are right where you were when that started. Why? Because your thinking didn't change. The thinking has to change. So another category, um, this is again completely different, behavioral, relational, financial, ideological. And ideology is your filter through which you interpret reality. And every person here has an ideology. And it's a mix of a lot of different things that we're going to be talking about in the weeks to come. But you know, pro-life, pro-choice, gay rights or not, evolution, creation, science, supernatural. Is it rational? Is it experiential? Humanism, hedonism, materialism, Christianity, other world religions, Islam, uh, for example. Where people are from, if you're, I'm from the north, I'm from the south, I'm from the city, urban, suburban, rural. All of these things are massively formative on the way that you interpret reality. Post-enlightenment rationalism, post-modern existentialism. And it doesn't matter if you don't know what all those words mean. I know what they mean. And you do have an ideology. You may even have an ideology that's biased against scholarship and, and, and toward experience or the reverse. You might be like, if it's not in a book, I don't believe it. 
You have this whole system of way that you process everything and nothing changes until thinking changes. Last category, moral. Is there a right and wrong? Do they have inherent outcomes? Is there automatic things that happen from doing right and automatic things that happen from doing wrong? Do you believe that and is it true? Can, can sin be resisted or is it inevitable? Can sin be defeated? Can sin be atoned for? Can sin be forgiven? Is there someone really watching all of this and are they keeping a record? And will I answer for it? And is he ready now to assist me in changing my thinking, all that you think about that and everything in the moral category? More categories could be given, but all that was to make this point, my battles are not primarily physical. If you could just embrace that. It's not where you live, it's not who you're with, it's not what you make, it's what you think. It's what I think. And I think that verse three is amazing. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. That battle for your priorities, that battle for your prodigal, that battle for better prospects in your marriage or in your life, all of that, all of those battles and the ones I can't think to mention right now that perfectly intersect with what's on your heart today, all of it is won or lost. Come on, point with me, where's it won or lost? Right here, the way I think. Secondly, because my battles are not primarily physical and then because my weapons uh, are not readily accessible. Notice what is readily accessible, verse four. For the weapons, oh, there's weapons? Yes, there's weapons to help you change your thinking. Awesome, here's the problem. The weapons of our warfare, that means literally our strategy for the campaign, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. The real weapons, Look up here, loved ones. It just helps me to make eye contact, thank you. The, the real weapons are not the quick, go-to, readily accessible weapons. Those are actually flesh weapons. And, and uh, make a note of this, when our first thought in a battle is to reach for our flesh weapons, the war is already lost. Now, do you wanna know what the flesh weapons are? Not that I really need to explain this because we all kind of have our PhD in flesh weapons. But uh, I like to get the message out of one passage, you know, as much as I can. But I'm going to turn, but just a bit, because I want you all to turn. Keep your finger in 2 Corinthians 10 and go three pages to the right. Three, page, three pages in my Bible. I guess that's probably not helping you a great deal. <laughs> Come on, love you. Galatians 5, 16 says, But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For sure, there is a war going on between the physical and the non-physical. For sure, it's a battle. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's a battle. Remember Jesus said, remember Jesus said to the disciples, the spirit is willing, but the, do you remember? The flesh is weak, for sure. Weak in terms of resisting sin, but strong in terms of demanding its own way. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. There's not a person here whose heart is sincere in this moment who wouldn't say, my behavior is falling behind what I believe to be true. I am not fully living what I would articulate as right. See, so that you, can, you see it there? Because of the battle. Keeps you from doing the things you want to do. Verse 19, so here's the flesh weapons, here they come. For the works of the flesh, here they are. They're evident, they're obvious, this isn't, you know, rocket science, but it is God's word. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. That's me, my flesh, what I want. And then idolatry, sorcery. That's, I'm going to find out about the future. I don't care how. Enmity, strife. Notice how many of these are relational issues. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. They're flesh weapons. So uh, somebody eats my lunch from the fridge at work. And I'm going to spend the next week showing them how rude that was. 
That's a flesh weapon. That's a flesh weapon. There was a way to handle that. But the way you handled it was you reached for dissension, division, rivalries. Put up your hand if you've ever done that. Come on. All right. Those are flesh weapons. And, but he said that's not what we should be reaching for. He goes on with the list. Dissensions, divisions, verse 21, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, those who do such things or those who have those things as the habit of their life. Change us, Lord, will not inherit the kingdom of God. If those patterns go on in your life uninterrupted, you're not saved. You're not going to heaven. That the proof of the salvation is the progress in the sanctification. And so not perfectly, as we say, but increasingly, this is the Lord's work in changing me. It starts with changing my mind. So, um, so I had lunch this week with a guy named Bob, a friend of mine named Bob. Somebody say, what about Bob? <laughs> so Bob um, doesn't attend our church, but he's a very uh, supportive friend, um, big walk in the word listener. I drove over to Woodfield and had lunch with him this week. He said I could tell you this as a praise to the Lord. But uh, Bob, awesome marriage, wife Heidi, um, uh, just one of those people, you see it in people, they just, for whatever reason, and God and his grace, they, that part just clicked for them. They just had an awesome marriage. And um, about 18 months ago, they, he left work during the day and had a nice romantic lunch with his wife, sent her on her way to work in the garden in the afternoon. He went back to work, gets this call. You gotta get home, you gotta get home now. It was the neighbor. He said, well, what, what, what? I can't tell you, just get here, Heidi, she's fallen, and get, get home. And, and he, halfway home, and, and they said, uh, don't come home, don't come home, go to the hospital. And he gets to the hospital standing there at the emergency when the emergency workers open the back of the ambulance. You know, God bless them, they didn't know any different, but it was just another day at the office for them. So they're laughing and patting out on the back as they drag his, as it turns out, now deceased wife out of the back of the ambulance. He's crushed. How does he tell his kids? I hadn't talked to him about it serious. I've seen him, but I hadn't talked to him about it serious till this week, 18 months. His wife gone. Mid 30s. She had the same thing Hank uh, Gathers had, if you remember that sports star. She had an enlarged heart, not just relationally, but she had an enlarged heart physically and it just working in the garden and just gone. So I was kind of curious to get with him and see how his thinking was going, especially because I've been thinking about all y'all all week and about all this, what we're doing this fall. And I wonder, well, I wonder how his thinking is. Sat down at Shaw's down there and uh, I was kind of blown away, honestly. His thinking is really good, really good. He's thinking right about God. He's thinking right about his wife. He's super burdened for his kids, you know, and he's like, you know, my kids are like, well, dad, are you going to leave too? And, and who could blame them for thinking that, right? You gotta promise me, Dad, that you're not gonna go anywhere. And 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 but he's even, you know, trying to help them with their thinking. And surely you can see in a significant issue separated from you, in which you're not directly emotionally involved, surely you can look at that and say, it's all gonna come down to how he handles it. You know, someone has said, and I believe it's true, that life is. 10% uh, what happens to you and 90% how you handle it. And even though my thinking doesn't want to let this in, the reality is that other people are going through things just like what I'm going through and they're doing a lot better than I am because they're thinking about it better than I'm thinking about it. And I don't want to do poorly. I want to do well. I remember about five or six years ago, I was going through a really tough a few months and uh, was really struggling even to preach and I just was really wrestling with some things and so I went and talked to a guy, a Christian man who uh, counsels people and, and he uh, kind of had been a friend to me in various ways so I called him up and I, I went and talked to him and this sentence I'm about to tell you changed my life. I told him the story and I said, well, I did this and then, and then this happened, and, but I did this and then this happened and now look where I am and what's gonna change this and how can this be different and I never intended for this and I kind of laid it all out for him and he said, well, James, this is where your best thinking has got you. Bam! I mean, that is an awesome insight. You are 
today? You didn't ever try to hurt yourself. Did you ever try to hurt yourself? Did you try to make your wife miserable? Did you try to, try to, did you try to get unhappy? Today, this month, the main goal is to get as unhappy as possible. Most people aren't working on that. Most people are working on the opposite. True or false? So if it's not happening like you know it could be happening, embrace this reality as I have. You are where... I love you. I'm not in a, even, I, I'm not in a hurry to say it because I don't want it to land heavily on your heart. I don't want to hurt you. But, I, you know, sometimes love is, I hope gently, saying what's true. And some of you may be carrying a great load right now. And so I'm not going to just flip that sentence on you. Just let me say it um, gently. You're where your best thinking has got you. Now, if it just happened a week ago, some big thing, if it just happened a month ago, there's tons of grace and it's going to take time. And I get all that. I don't want Bob to go home and start yelling at his kids because they're, I mean, how many people would agree it's going to take some time for them to sort that out? And maybe you're in a place where it's going to take you some time. I'm just trying to show you the roadmap here. Um, if you're where your best thinking has got you, then you're going to need some better thinking. So all of that to say that I do find verse 4 a little frustrating, and I want to tell you why. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. I mean, I thought here he would tell us what the weapons are. Notice in the text he doesn't tell us what the weapons are. How many people want to know what the weapons actually are? I want to know what the weapons are. But he doesn't tell us what the weapons are because... He wants us to stay focused on how effective the weapons are. So, because I love you, I'm going to just talk for a second. It's in other scriptures what the weapons are. Ephesians chapter 6 says, you've got all this defensive armor, but the only thing on offense to win the battle in your mind is what Ephesians 6 calls, verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the first thing that I use to change my thinking is, is the renewing of my mind. And if you think that all that's on the line in your daily time in God's Word is just a warm moment with your Creator, you couldn't be more wrong. You're renewing your mind. The Bible calls it the washing of the Word. In every television program, and every newscast, and every conversation that we have so often, clouds our thinking and this cleanses our thinking you've got to have this you've got to have it the sword of the spirit and another weapon is i won't turn there but if you went left instead of right from second corinthians 10 you'd get to second corinthians 6 7 which talks about the swords of righteousness in your right hand and in your left so you have these two swords of righteousness not my good behavior no no the righteousness of Jesus. Philippians 3, I have a righteousness that's not of my own, but that which comes through faith in Jesus. And it's the fact that no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what you regret, if you have turned from your sin and embraced Jesus Christ by faith, your Creator God, through your faith in His Son Jesus, declares you to be righteous. He sees you as righteous. He says that you are righteous, but we don't think of ourselves as the forgiven people that we are. So the weapon that we have in our thinking is, he calls them the swords of righteousness. It's who I really am because of Jesus, amen? So you have the sword of the spirit, you have the swords of righteousness, 2 Corinthians 6, 7, and you have your faith. 1 John 5 says, I think it's verse 4 says that Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And nothing will get your thinking to a better place than rejecting what seems to you to be true and embracing what God declares to be true. All right? And that's what we're going to be working on, and that's how people really change. So, um, and we need to change. And when our first thought in a battle is to reach for the flesh weapons, the war is already lost. And God help us to reach for the real weapons. For the weapons of our warfare, verse 4, are not of the flesh, 
They're not of the flesh. Notice he does describe these weapons, even if he doesn't tell us what they are. Notice that he says, first of all, they have, uh, they are divine. They have divine power. The word divine there with the word power literally means mighty. They are mighty to God. The weapons that God has given us to change our thinking, they are mighty to God. They're divine. God is the source of the weapons. Where do the weapons come from? Tell me, they come from God, don't they? Say that, they're from God. Weapons are from, they, the weapons come from God. And, and uh, notice also that they're powerful. These weapons are powerful. Now, I come up against this once or twice a year. It seems like a few months ago I was in the same place I am right now where I'm trying to tell you something's powerful and you all look at me like, maybe it is. And so I told you then and I'll tell, remind you again that um, the word translated here, power, is the word from which we get our word dynamite, right? It's, I'm talking really, these are super powerful weapons. Remember when I was trying to get that across to you before? I'm fired up right now. <laughs> and God has given you something powerful. I just got to watch my time carefully here. God has given you something powerful to address the problem. And the problem is, is that I don't believe that the weapons that God has given me are actually powerful. And I think that I need flesh weapons to solve my problems and I need to change my thinking. Notice the weapons are divine. Notice the weapons are powerful. And this is most important. Notice that the weapons, do you see there at the end of the verse, they destroy strongholds. Destroy strongholds. First, the word strongholds. Uh, the word strongholds uh, actually in some translations say fortresses. And, and uh, we don't have this so much today, but back in the ancient world, they would uh, be fearful for uh, enemy hordes uh, attacking their city, so they would build these fortified cities up on a hill, behind a wall. They get in behind their wall and they're like, we're safe up here. Nobody's gonna get us here. They can't get up here. They can't get through our walls. Nobody can touch us here in our stronghold. Now, it's not so much once the cannon was invented. It was like, the cannon obliterates the wall. The people scatter like, Ugh. And of course now planes just fly over the fortress and drop, as we've been seeing on the news, just drop uh, the bombs on. So it's not, it's not true anymore, but if you just realize this picture was chosen when none of that existed, so it still makes sense, and here it is. You have ways of thinking walled off in your mind that are keeping you from the life that God wants you to live. And they're fortresses, they're strongholds. You've been thinking that way for a long time and this preacher is gonna have to spend all the energy he has for the next three months, every single week storming that stronghold. And together we're gonna, to, notice the word destroy, because these divine weapons that we're gonna be using have the power to destroy. Notice God doesn't want to trim your stronghold. Notice God doesn't want to limit the effects of your stronghold. The picture here is of a wrecking ball a swinging into a tower. God wants, some translations say demolish, uh, destroy. All in favor of destroying strongholds? So the ways that you think that are keeping you, the ways that I'm thinking that are keeping me from what God has for me, they need to be, say it, destroyed, say it. The ways that we're thinking that are keeping us from what God has for us, they need to be, say it, they need to be destroyed. And that's why the text says, you might just reach over and underline that in your neighbor's Bible. They don't underline things when I tell them true because their thinking is always, well, I don't want to be told what to do. And that's actually a stronghold itself. We're tearing that down too. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh but have divine power to destroy strongholds. So why so hard to think differently? Because my battles are not primarily physical, because my weapons are not readily accessible. Here it is, because my strongholds are not easily destroyable. If destroying strongholds was easy, trust me, everybody would be doing it. Most people, Christian or not, sail the ship as far as it can go till the strongholds sink the ship and there they stay for the rest of their life. And while there are a few people in their teens or 20s or 30s maybe that change their thinking a little bit, most people have their thinking so deeply entrenched by the time they're into their second decade of adulthood, they don't go anywhere after that. 
They might change jobs, they might change churches, they might change marriages, but they don't change their thinking and they're shocked to find when they come around the corner, the exact same stuff still happened to me in the new scenery. Why? Because there's a lot more about your own thinking than there's a lot more about my own thinking than I was ever really willing to acknowledge. So strongholds are not easily destroyable. Let me give you some reasons why. And number one, because my old arguments made sense to me. That's the first part of verse five. We destroy arguments. The word arguments there uh, means reasonings. Uh, my reasons for my actions. Did you, know, did you know that pastors talk? Did you know pastors talk? I talk to pastors every week, and not just in our church, but in other churches around Chicago and around the country and so on. Pastors do talk. And I was talking to a pastor this week about a man that he was dealing with, um, who he was burdened about, and, and so I was getting an update. And a while ago, he had told me about this pastor that he, um, good news, um, uh, this man uh, had said, you know, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I have no excuse. I'm sorry. I wish I'd never done that. With God's help, I'll never do it again. I repent. Please forgive me. So I said, well, how's he doing now? And, and he kind of updated me, and, and, and I said, really? Yeah, he said, now he says, same guy, now he says, um, I'm not wrong. I never was. I don't regret anything. I wish I'd done it sooner. I wish I'd done it more. Same guy. Now, that is not nearly as shocking as you might think. And I don't want to have judgment for that man who's regressed because I've regressed. How many people have got to a good conclusion about something and then weeks or months later you're back to your old way of thinking about it? Does that ever happen to you? See, that's just, you just, when you spend months and months and months arguing with yourself, I am right, I am right, I am right, and then, and then one time you say, I am wrong, Go, t go talk to that girl again in three days. She might be back to I'm right again. Because that pattern of thinking is deeply entrenched. He's calling it here arguments. It means my reasons. Why I do what I do. I, I, look, look, every person has reasons why they do what they do. The man who robs the bank, the spouse who chooses to cheat, the kid who lies to cover his sin, the business owner who cooks the books, the church member who spreads strife, the Christian who lives in stubborn independence to the Savior he claims to trust. Everyone has their reasons, and strongholds don't get destroyed until those arguments are refuted and torn down. That's why Paul says, something's going to change in Corinth. Something's going to change in Corinth. We're going to destroy arguments. What else, Paul? Not just is it uh, strongholds are not easily destroyable because my old arguments made sense to me, but also my old opinions felt good. And so he says, uh, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion. God give you a moment of honesty right now. Do you have, I know my answer. Do you have some lofty opinions of yourself? Proverbs says, do not be wise in your own eyes. What does that mean? I think it's fairly clear what it means. Do not be wise in your own eyes. But our thinking, a lot of times, and honestly, Christians are the worst. Just saying it, us. Christians are the worst. The most strident, the most difficult, the most inflexible, the most insistent, the most stubbornly right about things. And there are some things that we can't agree to disagree about. I get it. But most of the problems aren't coming from that. Most of us, our life isn't sideways because we're arguing with someone about who Jesus Christ is or if the Bible's God's word. The problem is, is that we've taken that doctrinal certainty, and we've applied that to so many issues about which we could be deferential, we could be reasonable, we could be measured, but somehow we're not. My old opinions feel good. You like them. Your lofty opinions, we like them. We like them. 
I like the opinions that make me feel good today. And who's going to win? The Bears are going to win today. Really, 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 you really think that's going to happen? Because I can already hear the talk radio tomorrow if it doesn't happen. I knew they weren't going to win. It doesn't matter. You've got a lofty opinion on either side of that. You know, you say, I always know, I know, I know, I know, I know. They feel good. Lofty opinions feel good. And then because my old mind is opposed to God, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. At the end of the day, these bad reasons, these old arguments, these old opinions, these things are opposing God. And it's not going to change until we see it like it is. Joseph said, how can I do this wickedness against God? And until we see it like it really is, it's not going to change. And here he says they're in direct opposition to God. When we oppose God, when we oppose God's work, we are opposing God himself. And Jesus suffered our pain to free us from a pleasure called sin that only causes pain uh, in the end. Sin doesn't help. It isn't good. It may be for a moment, but in the end, it destroys. And if we think differently, the thinking has to change. That's what the gospel is all about. But my old opinions, they're just comfortable. They, they okay, so they're opposed to God. Anything else? Well, just that they, my old opinions came natural. Notice here he says, and take every thought Captive, that's the language of we, we took uh, prisoners. We took prisoners. Every thought that doesn't go with the knowledge of God will be taken prisoner, will be taken off the field of battle in my mind. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, if the truth were known, how many thoughts do you think in a day that you didn't even consciously decide to think? Hey, what are you all cranky about? I don't know. You could probably figure out a couple things, but it's just the way when circumstances are not favorable, you slip into a moodiness that is punishing to others. You know what I'm saying? And why are you moody like that? I don't know. I always handle things this way. Right. Correct. And until the thinking about how to handle things that are adverse changes, nothing else is going to change. It's actually a lofty opinion it's, a, it's an old way of thinking that feels good to us but opposes God, and we have to take that thought captive. We have to be like, no more unfiltered thoughts. No more unapproved, unfiltered, where did that come from thoughts. Every thought that I think is going to get reviewed. I found myself driving over to church this morning thinking about something. Kathy said, what are you thinking about? I didn't even tell her because I didn't want to tell her because she's already told me. You've got to let that go. So I just said, I'm not thinking about it anymore. <laughs> and I took that thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The thought was not defensible. The thought was not biblical. The thought was not helpful. It has to go. It has to be taken prisoner. It, it, it can't get into my head unfiltered, unchosen. It has to be rejected. It has to be. If I'm going to get to a better place. But that old pattern comes so naturally. It comes so easily. Fourth reason why it's so hard to think differently. Because my engagement must be personal. My engagement has to be personal. Do you understand that I can't think different thoughts for you? I mean, I would if I could. I love you. I'm going to pour myself into this series, and I'm encouraging you to do the same and be here every single week. You'll look at how God changed your life in the fall of 2014 if you come be part of this. But I can't do it for you, and that's why Paul says in verse 6, being ready to punish every disobedience. He says, I'm coming. I'm going to take care of some things, but I can't do it until your obedience is complete. See it there? You gotta do your part before anyone else can do their part. You gotta do your part before anyone else can do their part. And I can't change your thinking for you. And so the fourth the reason why it's hard to change my thinking is because I gotta make it personal. I gotta choose to do this myself. No one could do this work for me. And uh, you know how power, I can't wait to tell you so many things. Let me just close with this. Do you know how powerful the mind is? The mind is so powerful that we don't even begin to understand its impact on everything. For example, um, it won't surprise you at all that I eat really fast. Fast, like 
I was good. Because I eat really fast, I also get the hiccups a lot. And because I get the hiccups a lot, I've heard about a lot of different remedies through the years and, you know, get somebody to scare you. Uh, that didn't work very good. Um, hold your breath. Or, you know, sometimes they would say, you know, drink something upside down and, and that'll, that I've tried it all. And, and, and so this week I had the hiccups so bad that the chair was rocking and it wasn't a rocking chair. And Kathy, who I love so dearly, you know, in, in a way that only she could, she had heard this from someone. She came to me and I was hiccuping, like waiting for the next one. And she said, you're calm. Let it go. You don't have the hiccups anymore. And I didn't. <laughs> and those who study the mind would tell you that the reason why there are things like this so many different remedies around something like that is because they work if your mind believes that it works on something like that that will work for you and everybody swears by a different thing why because they believe that and it works for them all right so uh, obviously we have truth that is far more than subjective i'm only just saying that there's so much power in what we think it, it directs so many things that we can't even understand and we're going to have a great time studying this together and changing for God's glory. Let's stand together for prayer. Father, thank you that we can be here today. Thank you for every one of these hungry hearts. God, we love these people. And what we pray for ourselves and for our own family, we pray for these brothers and sisters that by your grace a season of life transformation would be ahead of us. I pray for every small group leader and every counselor and every caregiver in our church that has been praying and longing to see breakthrough in the lives of some of the people that they're caring for. And I pray for every doubting heart that's here at church today who can't bring themselves to believe that God could change some things in their life because they've always thought like a skeptic. They've always thought like a critic. and. Uh, God, we all have these patterns of thinking that are so hurtful to your purposes, so detrimental to your glory. And so for the fame of the name of your son, Jesus, and for our greater joy, for your greater glory, we ask you to help us in the weeks ahead to truly think differently. Do it, God, so that we can boast in how awesome you are and how faithful you are, and how powerful your weapons are. Begin that work now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.